It's 33. Let's start. At least we reward all those that uh, came early. <laughs> okay, okay. So we start now. Okay, good morning and afternoon, everybody. Uh, Honorable uh, Vice Rector, Universitas Sumatra Utara, all speakers. Uh, and all participants, we are scattered from different uh, time here for more than 20 countries. Uh, thank you for participating in our webinar, uh, joint webinar from CSSPO, Universitas Sumatra Utara and Wakanikan University and Research uh, that, it, that has a long history of concern in palm oil industry. Um, but not only that, uh, we, I think we're also reflecting, uh, the, representing the main consuming and producing countries of palm oil. Uh, so without further taking your time, uh, I would like to give this stage for, for our Vice Rector for Information uh, Planning and Development. Uh, please welcome Prof. Bustami -san. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Dr. Diana Khalil, co-host and also head of consortium studies for smallholder palm oil. Uh, Professor Maya Singerland. Uh, sorry, Slingerland. From Waganigan um, and other uh, partners, professors, and participants who are already in this webinar's room, especially Pa Bayu Krishna Mukti, yang saya kira kita pernah ketemu di Kuching about two years ago, <laughs> something like that, Bu Diana. Ya, ketemu lagi, senang bertemu dengan Bapak di sini. Serta para uh, peserta sekalian. And Pak Dupita. Uh, today, Pak. on behalf of Director Universitas Sumatera Utara, Professor Runto, I'll give a opening remark uh, to all of us today that uh, we are very happy to meet here in the uh, webinar, even though you know we are in tech, each other for each other due to the uh, the pandemic of the COVID nineteen, and we all hope that uh, everybody here is very good condition. Uh, you you can hear me, right? Okay. So uh, the topic. <laughs> All right, thank you. The topic of the uh, webinar today is the, uh, you know, viewing the inclusiveness in the uh, oil palm industry, especially in the uh, uh, supply chain. Um, we, uh, Universitas Sumatera Utara, you know, um, I have a very good, a very good cooperation with uh, palm oil industries as well as uh, the association uh, of palm industries here and in uh, Jakarta. In Jakarta, and we have uh, other campus. We, we call it uh, Kuala Bekala. Uh, in very near future, we are going to have a. We call it. Uh, palm oil etalase, what we call it, is like a botanical garden. Uh, also, we are going to have a, a Technobis Park incorporating a quadruple helix. Quadruple helix approach is also, um, I think, applicable to how uh, we 
empower the smallholders in order to reduce the, uh, you know, to, to make the in inclusiveness in the palm oil industry. Of course, the four elements that already been discussed, I think for a long time, uh, including uh, a voice in with the small holders have to have a, a very good, a, a very good cooperation with farm industries. Also, um, you know, I, I, I believe that um, government have to take part also there. So as a quadruple helic uh, government um, in which in the regulation, because without the re regulation, maybe industries uh, will don't care about it. And in other, uh, other part of the quadruple helic is the role of the university. The role of university, for example, today we gather more, a lot of a lot of university here, you know, um, from Indonesia, also from from abroad, like Wageningen, and other university in Malaysia, and uh, in Thailand, something like that. So that we can form what we call it uh, intellectual clusters to strengthen the industrial clusters, so that at the end we can improve the inclusiveness. Uh, I'm lucky that uh, I read some article, especially by Professor Maya in, 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 many, in many publication that I believe that what we are doing today, what we discussed today, uh, is supposed to be um, implemented and we think about what next after next, uh, you know, to, to make the implementation of the inclusiveness of the palm oil industry, especially in the uh, supply chain. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and discuss, discuss for the discussion in this uh, webinar uh, and have a fruitful discussion. And thank you for the all participants. Terima kasih kepada terutama ini sahabat kami Prof. Rena Bapak Bayu ya ketemu lagi senang kita bersama-sama di sini. Terima kasih kepada Bu Diana yang terus uh, giat untuk mengembangkan ini semua dan kita bersyukur Bu Diana karena uh, akhirnya CSPO ini jadi sebuah konsorsium ya yang tadinya seminar ya barangkali dimulai dari lab ya akhirnya menjadi sebuah konsorsium. Saya kira ini sebuah usaha yang yang jangan kita sia-siakan untuk selanjutnya. On behalf of Rector, thank you all. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Profesor Busami. Uh, so uh, as Profesor already mentioned that this is only a start. Hopefully this will be a good start for all of us to be further collaborate in any activities that can improve the inclusivity of the smallholders uh, in particular or the in general, the palm oil industry and sustainability. Uh, without further uh, uh, taking the time, uh, I would like to pass this stage to Maya, uh, which will be the mod moderator for the whole session. The stage is yours, Maya. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Um, don't be too shy. You are also moderating uh, part of the session, but uh, uh, a welcome from me as well to this uh, audience. Um, we already uh, showed some rules of the game, but I think it's good to repeat them. So we expect everybody to stay mute and uh, also to uh, put off their cameras during the sessions. And uh, I will tell people to come on board. So I will tell you to unmute or to come to open your camera because else it will be a bit uh, messy. Um, but before we start the program, uh, we would like to see who is in the room. So we have a few polls for you. So can I have the first uh, poll, please? So the question is, can you, you can click? Yeah, you.
this is uh, automatically. So we can see how many people are from which places. Not everybody voted yet. And we see a pattern already that most people are from Southeast Asia. Perhaps that's also due to the time that we uh, we choose for the seminar, and also because many of the producing uh, producers are in uh, Southeast Asia, of course. I think about 80% of the people voted. Yeah, Southeast Asia is clearly the winner. And uh, it's quite uh, clear. So um, can we have the second poll, which is about um, your the affiliation of the people? So are you from government, from NGO? Are you from a farmer or from farmers union? Are you private sector? Uh, knowledge institute that can be universities or research centers, or perhaps you're just an individual very interested, then you will vote independent. So anybody farmer, farmer union, just uh, push farmer. And private sector is not just companies, it's also banks or uh, fertilizer companies, it's not just oil palm companies. So we see here that uh, if we see the results, we see that uh, most of us, almost 40% are from knowledge institutes, but fortunately there are also 15% of the government, 17% uh, of NGO and 21% of private sector. I think this, this poll mainly reflects our networks. So it's not so surprising that knowledge institute uh, comes first because we know a lot of scientists, but I think it's very promising to see that uh, there's a, a good distribution over other sectors because it shows that there are some partnerships. Uh, unfortunately, farmers and farmer union is very low, but perhaps it's also difficult to reach them through this medium. So we have to think about how to reach them better. Can we have the next poll? So just to see why you entered this seminar, is it because you work on oil palm? Is it because you work on smallholders or is it you work on both? We think the seminar is equally important for people that just work for, with smallholders and not necessarily with oil palm. Let's see if we also reach those audiences. No, it's not surprising that uh, almost 60% of the participants enrolled because they are uh, participating in, uh, in both oil palm and smallholders. But it's also good to see that we reach people that uh, work with smallholders, but necessarily with oil palm, which means that we may need to say a few extra words about the oil palm sector in our presentations to make sure people understand what we talk about. So thank you for this poll. And uh, we'll stop sharing this. And we will go to the first uh, speaker. The first speaker is uh, Lupito Simamora. 
um, perhaps you can uh, share your camera and we can unshare so that um, we can see who, who Dupito is. Is Dupito there? Yes, please. So the Dupito Simamora is a career diplomat. He has been assigned to uh, four Indonesian diplomatic missions abroad, Rome, New York, Canberra, and Brussels. He has more than 30 years of service and held several positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, was also assistant to the Deputy of Foreign Relations at the Coordinating Ministry of Political, Legal, and Security Affairs. His last assignment abroad was the Dep Deputy Chief of Mission at the Indonesian Mission Embassy at the European Union, Belgium, and Luxembourg. In that capacity, he chaired the working group of palm oil producing countries in Brussels from 2017 to 2019. He obtained his degrees on the University of Sumatera Utara in Medan and also in uh, Monash University in Melbourne. And he followed uh, different uh, diplomatic training courses and also the United Nations peacekeeping operation training. Uh, Dupito officially assumed his role as a deputy ex executive director of the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries with a CPOPC, you will see this abbreviation more often, so I repeat, Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, in July 2019. And in this capacity, he actively supports the realization of seven main functions of this CPOPC and other priorities and tasks mandated by the member countries. He is here in this capacity of uh, the CPOPC, and he will present to us the importance of smallholders in oil palm production. Mr. Dupito, the floor is yours. Can you uh, open your microphone and share your screen, please? Yeah, your microphone is open. About my presentation? Yeah. Okay. I don't, yeah, it's coming. Okay. Can yeah. you see? Yeah, we can see it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maya. Good good morning to fellow uh, panelists uh, and also participants in Europe. And good afternoon to all screen? colleagues. Can you put Pardon it me? on full screen? Oops, wait. Full screen is on the bottom. Yeah. Anyway. Just go back to the first slide. We will do like this. It's okay. Good. Sorry. Yeah. Can you see the full, uh, you know, slide now? Yeah, we see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the colleagues in Asia. Uh, first of all, uh, I thank the organizing committee uh, for having me uh, in this important discussion, and particularly, please. Uh, to know that uh, my alma mater, Husu, is one of the co-organizers. And, and of course, uh, it is also uh, important for me to note uh, the intention of Husu to be you know, uh, more active in this uh, uh, palm oil uh, uh, related uh, um, uh, uh, matters. The, the share of smallholders is the topic given to me by the organizing committee. And since I am, I am with uh, CPOPC, the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, allow me to share some interplays between national and international actors and factors in our efforts to ensure inclusiveness of smallholders in the supply chain. I would share three perspectives. Uh, first is an overview of the smallholders around the globe. The second is uh, about CIPOPC's role on smallholders. And the third is about inclusivity at international fora as we cannot disregard or disconnect global agenda from farmers. My last slide will be about uh, food for thought for further discussion. Um, in, this, uh, in this slide, we can see the number of uh, smallholders both in Indonesia and Malaysia. And it is almost similar in terms of a smallholding percentage of the industry in both countries. There is a uh, 42 and 40% respectively. Due to larger scale of the industry in Indonesia, the number of farmers is more than five times than in Malaysia. But uh, the number alone, 2.6 million 
it is like a quarter of uh, the population of Belgium. And if we consider all those uh, involved in the industry directly or indirectly, uh, it is uh, almost equal or equal to the population of the Netherlands. And I believe that uh, you know this uh, kind of uh, uh, statistics should be kept in mind by our colleagues in Brussels or in their decision-making process. In the second slide, in the second slide, um, we have uh, palm oil producing countries uh, around the globe and the percentage of smallholders in the industry supply chain. Um, in our uh, you know, preliminary observation, there are at least uh, you know, uh, 50 countries considered as palm oil producing countries in the equator. If you look at the diagram uh, on your left, at least there are uh, 14 countries listed there but we can always uh, have more countries from the three regions, such as from Africa, we can have Kenya, Malawi, Madagascar, Mozambique, Benin, and, and also from uh, our region, we can have the Philippines, India, and Solomon Islands. And the same thing also happens with the Central and Latin America. We can have uh, countries like Nicaragua, Mexico, Peru, Panama, and Suriname. What is uh, you know, consistent uh, from the three regions is that the number of smallholders is quite high. It is more than uh, 40%. If you look at uh, the three diagrams there, small three diagrams there, Thailand has more than 70%. Nigeria uh, with more than 90%. Ghana also uh, more than 88%. And Honduras is extremely high with 90% of smallholders. Uh, you know, I intentionally uh, chose the four countries because they belong to the 15, uh, the big 15 in terms of production. So my take is uh, the smallholders are the, in fact, the backbone of the industry in many countries, or in other words, we cannot disregard smallholders as they are integral part and also crucial player in the industry. Let's now, uh, move to the second uh, point. Uh, that is the fourth uh, slide in my presentation. That is, uh, I would like to, you know, to bring to your attention about what CPOPC is for smallholders. If you look at uh, the CPOPC charter, there are three main references on smallholders. That is uh, in article three on the scope uh, and also functions of CPOPC. That is to enhance the welfare of the oil farm smallholders and also articles eight and 12 on the need to establish a forum for smallholders. Thus, in my opinion, CPOPC should always give a priority when it comes to interest of smallholders. Enhancing the welfare of smallholders is the goal, but how to achieve it is the real challenge. In my observation, it is not possible to achieve smallholders' welfare without providing the assistance they need or in other words, capacity building, such as infrastructure, financing, certified seeds, technical assistance, market access, certain types of technology, the challenge of conservation, sustainability issues, and remunerative price for them to survive and also to get some profit. Oil farm uh, smallholders in many countries uh, may, may face different challenges at local and national levels, but there are common problems such as organizational issue. One lesson learned is that it is crucial to have organized farmers. The better they are organized, the more effective they are in addressing and representing their common concerns. It, is, it also means that good organization of smallholders will facilitate them to be more inclusive in the whole supply chain. Um, if you look at the, you know, this slide, uh, CPOPC actually uh, uh, conducted a cross visit, you know, to to Malaysia from Indonesia, from Indonesia to Malaysia last December. We had uh, more plans to do to do uh, some uh, other cross visits, but uh, you know, due to the pandemic, uh, all had to be postponed. Actually, last month, it was our intention uh, to also have uh, the first uh, summit of uh, uh, smallholders in Medan which was supposed to be attended by at least 15 producing countries. But again, it is unfortunate that this event should be, should be postponed due to the uh, COVID-19. But since in our opinion, 
uh, reaching out to small holders, uh, you know, uh, should be done. So next month, we will organize outreach program separately to the three regions of Asia Pacific, Africa, and Central and Latin America. We will kickstart the program with Asia Pacific, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, in the first week of August. In this slide, uh, uh, you know, I would like to, to bring to your attention uh, about smallholders and the global agenda. Uh, what happens in the global arena will affect smallholders uh, directly, or in the, directly or indirectly. There are many factors beyond national borders that might affect the interests of farmers of market access like uh, RED2 and its delegated regulation, discrimination from regulatory bodies like the EU, palm oil free labels in many countries, WHO recent misleading information on health and palm oil, the imposition of certain standards uh, for palm oil without consulting or the consent of producing countries. The voice of smallholders should be heard and taken into account by other countries and also by regional and international organizations. I'm convinced that uh, inclusiveness of smallholders should be promoted not only in the producing countries, but also in the consuming countries. Partnership for smallholders like NISCOPS between the Netherlands with uh, five palm oil producing countries is welcome. That is a good idea. If the EU would like to contribute, it will have much uh, greater impact uh, to the smallholders around the globe, especially you know, the, the main producers uh, you know, in our region, Africa, and also Latin America. But uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, in my opinion, all those technical assistance without finding a solution to sustainability issue and also discriminative policies and market access will be less meaningful, if not meaningless. That said, the only option is to work uh, for partnership through many fora. And I believe and the Amsterdam Declaration partnership should also play its role in bridging the palm oil producing countries and the EU. We are 10 years before concluding uh, the Global Agenda 2030. And of course, based on the, the studies available, the oil sector contributes tangibly to the attainment of uh, goals embodied in the UN SDGs. But it is pertinent to, to ask how UN bodies such as UNGA, the FAO, IFAD, UNEP, play its role in promoting sustainability standards for all vegetable oils to make the cultivation and production of all vegetable oils done in a sustainable way. Um, as a, some uh, uh, food for thought for further discussion, allow me to you know to share with you four uh, you know a few points. The first is that um, as described before, palm oil is not only about Indonesia and Southeast Asia, but it is increasingly about the global South, as many tropical countries have and are developing palm oil industry. Second. Smallholders uh, play a crucial role in the industry as they represent more than 40% of the whole production. In my understanding, the global alliance of producers and smallholders is needed to address discriminative policies and practices, to address impediments to trade, to counter uh, negative campaigns, to promote upstream and downstream industry, to develop renewable energy such as the biodiesel programs, to promote principles of sustainability for, for, of oil palm and sustainability standards for all vegetable oils and price stabilization. Third point is that uh, I believe it is in the interest of the EU to find an acceptable solution on sustainable palm oil while producing countries, uh, with, with producing countries, not just to convince others, to quote the recent statement by EU Commissioner for Trade recently, but to work for partnership through dialogue and consultation. Oil palm is not just a commodity, but it is also about people, millions of them looking for a better life, jobs, income, and livelihood. Smallholders inclusivity should be adopted by consuming countries as well. My last point is that uh, 
from a CIPOPSI's uh, perspective. In, I'm, in my understanding, CIPOPSI can play a crucial role, perhaps a leadership role in advancing the interests of the industry, smallholders included, in international fora. In essence, smallholders uh, should be, from, uh, should be uh, smallholders inclusiveness and inclusivity should be promoted in the whole supply chain of the industry, like the uses from farm to fork. Thank you for your kind uh, attention. And since I'm quite active on Twitter, mostly on palm oil, okay, uh, please consider to, to, you know, to, to, to follow me. Uh, I think that is just a uh, you know, plea for me. Thank you. Thank you again, Maya, for the opportunity given to me. And, and uh, I have to inform you that um, the director of uh, smallholders of CPOPC is also present among us. So I think uh, he will be happy also to respond to any 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 questions if they if uh, you know uh, there will be uh, uh, from the uh, participants at the later stage. Thank you. Okay, Pak Dubito, uh, Sima Mura, thank you very much for your interesting uh, contribution. I think you opened up the, the floor from uh, smallholders in in uh, producing countries to the whole world. And I think also that the CPOPC, let me repeat what it is, is the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries can really right. play a role in representing the smallholders in the in the heavy debates that are going on in the global arena. So thank you so much. And thank I think you. it's really important uh, what you stress that uh, inclusiveness is not just um, uh, at, at, uh, at the working floor, but it's also in the policies. So thank you so much. Um, the next uh, speaker uh, will be uh, Diana Shalil. Diana, you have already uh, shared your camera, so that's nice. Uh, Diana began studying small oil palm oil supply chains in 2003 while undertaking her PhD in the University of Sydney. And since then, she has conducted a number of studies related to palm oil. Um, she formed a consortium studies of small oil palm oil. CSSPO. Today we have a lot of abbreviations that we will have to learn, but I will repeat them uh, several times. So Consortium Studies of Smallholder Palm Oil, CCSPO. And she formed it with colleagues from Indonesia, uh, Universitas Jambi, Universitas Malikusala, with Malaysia, University Putra Malaysia, and with Thailand, Prince of Songkhai University. And it's really interesting to see that this uh, research consortium is uh, countries overarching. Since 2016, this, uh, this the CSSPO also partnered with CIRAT to conduct joint research and establish annual conferences. They also trained uh, smallholders engaged in smallholder replanting programs in uh, Indonesia and actively participate in the Indonesian palm oil platform. Currently, she's appointed as the coordinator for a palm oil study program as a collaboration between university research, research centers, and palm oil association. For this seminar, it's very important to know that uh, Diana Shalil has studied smallholder inclusiveness. So she will help us to understand it by providing a definition of inclusiveness and sharing us the findings of her study. So Diana, please put on your microphone and share your screen with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, it's coming. Sorry. <laughs> Can you put in uh, full screen mode, please? Oh, yeah. Is it better? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. The floor is yours. OK. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Maya. Thank you very much, all. Uh, within uh, these uh, 10 minutes, I will try to give uh, some share brief uh, understanding about the conceptual and empirical discussion about inclusivity. Uh, so as Maya already mentioned that I'm also uh, talking this in behalf of other four universities. 
So uh, there are uh, various perceptions about the inclusivity. Uh, although we are coming from the smallholder consortium, we are really aware that the inclusivity is not just about uh, the smallholders, as already been mentioned by Pat Dupito, but it's also about the whole stakeholders along the supply chain. Uh, but within this uh, webinar, we are going to focus on the smallholders. Uh, so I quote this one that uh, this is really showing the level of inclusivity because uh, we, uh, we can find it uh, in the empirical condition from various cases. So uh, I tried to use one of the broadly uh, used, uh, including in the studies uh, about the, the understanding about the inclusivity inclusivity from, come from Fermil and, and Katula in 2010 that has four components of inclusivity. Uh, in fact, there are so many uh, programs and uh, studies that uh, only focus on two components of it, that is ownership and reward. Uh, for example, if we can see the land share increasing, we just assume that uh, smallholder already being an inclusive part of the supply chain. And if they got uh, higher prices and uh, increasing productivity, they already uh, enjoyed the inclusivity. But are these enough? Uh, because there are indications that the inclusive Inclusive inclusivity is not really sustained because uh, sometimes we ignore the voice, what they really need, what are the issues in making the inclusivity works. And then of course the risk, uh, this is also a risky components because we can see it from two sides. First, we can see uh, the risk from how it uh, reduced, uh, whether it uh, transferred or uh, in, uh, to other parties like the uh, company's partners. But the second one we can also see from the improvement of uh, risk management skill from the smallholders. But for this study, I only uh, see or measure uh, estimate from the uh, reduce of uh, risk uh, uh, facing by the smallholders. So, uh, taking the Indonesian oil palm smallholder cases, uh, I, I tried to follow and modify uh, the components uh, estimation or measures from what uh, Vermelin and Katula already used. For the reward, I uh, use uh, the productivity, selling price, and income as a measure of that. Uh, score it for the minimum. Uh, uh, score zero and the maximum three or four depends on how many uh, uh, questions that uh, we, we ask to the respondents. And then the second one is the ownership. Uh, I see from the land, uh, whether the size of the land or status of the land and the group asset. Uh, for the voice, uh, we try to measure it from the uh, bargaining power and then the involvement in price meeting and whether their involvement in a group which is uh, used for delivering aspiration. And as I already mentioned, for the risk, uh, I'm more focused on the reduce of the risk itself by transferring to other parties like uh, uh, company uh, partners. Uh, uh, this can be seen from uh, two aspects. First, uh, in the groups purchasing, input purchasing and output sales. And the second one from the supervision, uh, whether it's in agronomic or pest management supervision. Uh, we conduct it in four provinces that we can see the green color showing uh, the, uh, the land, uh, the total land size in these provinces uh, that more than 50,000 hectares, while, while the uh, green, uh, the yellow one uh, in between 10,000 until 50,000, and the red one is less than 10,000. So we take this part, the Sumatra Island, uh, which is uh, the mostly developed uh, uh, 
oil palm plantations. So uh, uh, aware about the, uh, the smallholders characteristics, it's not uh, homogeneous. There are lots of variations and uh, there is no single definition of uh, uh, clustering that one. Uh, we try to take two aspects. That is a partnership because many uh, believe and already shown that partnership is one of the aspects that can improve the inclusivity. And the second one is the certification. Taking the standards uh, through certification uh, is assumed to uh, meet the fulfill or fulfill the demand from global market. So with these two things, we can cluster it in six uh, groups. Uh, we try to cover the whole six group, but unfortunately we uh, only got five. Uh, the one that without partnership, uh, certified without partnership haven't been covered yet in this study. Uh, this study is uh, already been published um, uh, in 2019. Uh, uh, in, uh, including in ATFRN uh, by me, Halil Barus, and uh, Bayu Krishna Murti. Uh, we involve 194 and 197 scheme and independent smallholders, respectively. So uh, we can see from this result that uh, the most left uh, side uh, showing the certified one and the most uh, right side one is the non-certified and non-partnership. So having the highest uh, bar graphs uh, showing that um, inclusivity uh, from the whole four components is higher uh, with partnerships and certification. And if we want to see more detail in that, uh, from the whole five cases, types of uh, partnership, we can see uh, in general that voice uh, appear to be least prior prioritized, uh, showing by the low uh, value of the bar, the, the shortest one, while the risk uh, shown the, the highest one. So uh, voice uh, is already uh, is already uh, uh, there, but it's not really uh, prioritized. So what is why is it so important, and what is the possible in, uh, impact of that? I only want to to raise one uh, example for that uh, because uh, Indonesia currently is in the middle of replanting, and there are no single data. Uh, 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 strong, uh, robust data about the, the size of the whole small holdings in Indonesia. But uh, one uh, data, I got it from uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, small holding uh, company and from uh, the uh, director general of uh, plantation estimate around 6.2 million hectares uh, is the total number of oil palm smallholdings in Indonesia. And because it's uh, already started uh, at the late uh, 80s, so uh, now most of them already passed the economic age and require planting because if not, uh, it's going to be uh, decreasing the uh, total production because of the low productivity. Uh, furthermore, if they have low productivity, they need more land and then they will use more land, uh, but only having same income level uh, uh, to support their family needs. And unfortunately, uh, we find that most of the small holdings cannot uh, do it by themselves. So, because if you, because uh, during this replanting, we think that is the, the important uh, timing for improving uh, the performance of small holdings. Uh, following the standard one, we need around 60 million rupiah or 4.1K USD. Uh, assuming 50% need to be supported, it means that 12.8 billion USD is needed for uh, replanting the whole uh, oil palm small holdings. That is a big uh, amount of number. So 
if this cannot be uh, provided, uh, the 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 impact will be significant because the share of the total oil palm small holdings is more than 50, 40% so already mentioned by Pat Dupito. Is it pos impossible to have a, a, a complete uh, uh, inclusivity uh, covering the whole four components? Uh, it's not impossible, although it's still very rare. We find that a number of small holdings group already successfully implementing that. For example, one in North, uh, South Sumatra, uh, this is their land is, uh, if you cannot say is uh, better than the uh, private plantation, is similar with, uh, in quality with the private plantation. Uh, although they already being independent now, they are not uh, being steam or plasma anymore. And they already uh, uh, continue to the second cycle showing that independency and sustainability is there uh, since they're already being involved in the whole um, activities uh, from steps to steps uh, with uh, their partner company. Uh, but is it, uh, is it easy? Of course, it's not easy. There are so many challenges that we can find first that uh, we already know that uh, uh, our palm oil supply chain uh, involving uh, big companies, uh, uh, multinational, while uh, the smallholders individual land use is only two or four hectares. It means that if they want to be uh, equal, uh, equal, uh, equal players. They have to have a collective management. Is that we will we'll explain to us uh, later on how difficult it it is going to uh, to have a, a good collective management. And the second one, we know that uh, naturally, uh, oil palm is a long term uh, business. At least uh, for only one cycle, it already involved to 25 years. While in fact, in the ground, we can see that most of the small holders doesn't have any record and no long, long term. So it's very difficult for them to have long term financial plan. And of course, because they also don't have processing facilities while fresh fruit bunches uh, harvested from the oil plantation uh, is not uh, production that can be sold as end product. Uh, they need to be to have a very well integration with the processor and traders or exporters. And uh, also uh, they have to uh, understand about the market demand, including the global market demand, because we know that palm oil is uh, export oriented uh, production. Uh, and one of the demand is uh, sustainable management one, uh, showing by the certification. While a su sustainable certification for smaller is still expensive and not very easy to fulfill. So, um, Given this, uh, I know this is uh, not really conclusive one because there are so many details and so long discussion about that. But at least I want to uh, to end this one with uh, four points. The first one that uh, inclusivity itself is not only ownership and reward. Of course, ownership and reward is important, but voice and risk is also equal importance. And then uh, I also want to raise that although it's important, uh, currently a voice is uh, least prioritized. And risk appear to be the most beneficiaries, the highest beneficiaries one, stemming from the partnership and collective action. Uh, so it's also shown that partnerships and certification could, could improve uh, inclusivity. Uh, if you want more details about that, uh, you can just uh, see, uh, click the link and see the details in uh, this link. With this, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana, for a very interesting presentation. I uh, really appreciate that you introduced the concepts of uh, smallholder inclusiveness. And also that you showed clearly that uh, within certification, apparently inclusiveness has, uh, has a larger score than in the other partnerships. But in, in any case, partnerships are very important. 
And it's also nice to see that you, you came across examples where it works. So that is also very reassuring to us. Um, surprisingly, I'm not only moderating, but I also will present you myself uh, some findings. And um, I will also introduce myself now briefly. I'm an assistant professor in Wageningen University. I have uh, a strong uh, research uh, portfolio uh, regarding smallholders, both in Africa and in Southeast Asia. And for me, small uh, livelihoods are very much uh, about uh, nutritious food, decent incomes, and, um, and voice. Um, for the last 15, year, 15 years, I've been doing research on smallholder uh, oil palm um, and oil palm farmers. And um, I engage mostly with uh, NGOs and governments and companies to try also to the research will be used and not just be for uh, publications on the shelf. Recently, I co-organized a webinar on living income that was for cocoa smallholders, but it shows that we try to reach out and also try to see uh, income, not just as money, but also as a decent income with all kinds of uh, components. So in this uh, webinar, I will share with you two means to in improve on inclusiveness. One is about upgrading and the other is about um, uh, integrated uh, oil palm systems. Let me share my screen. Yeah. So um, this is about uh, strategies to improve inclusiveness. And um, how do I do next slide? Yeah. So it is about uh, adding more value to the smallholders from the whole supply chain, and that can be done by upgrading. But it's also about fitting better to smallholder livelihood needs, which can be done by integrated systems. So let me start with upgrading. Upgrading, the definition is from the business perspective, so we might need to adapt it, but the definition says it is about the acquisition of technological capabilities and about market linkages that give an opportunity to improve competitiveness and transform to higher value. And I think key to me is that it will allow higher value and especially for the smallholders as well. So there are four types. Uh, Mitchell and Coles 2011 will inform you more on that. There are four types of upgrading. One, and that is what many agronomists work on, is uh, the process. And the process, the uploading, upgrading by process is to improve the efficiency at farm level. So you can imagine that people uh, put a lot of effort in uh, helping farmers to uh, use best management practices to increase their yield. And if they have higher yields per hectare, they may increase their income. So that is upgrading by process. But you can also focus on upgrading by product. And that means you improve the quality of the product. This can also be done by best management practices, but it can also be done by going faster from the farm to the mill. And then you get higher oil extraction rates. And if you can prove that you have higher oil extraction rates, you can also negotiate a better price. So here you also get higher income. Another way to improve your quality can be to improve your sustainability. And if you improve your sustainability in, in several aspects, you may apply for certification and we can think of RSPO, ISPO, MSPO, but also uh, the ones that are more focused on carbon. And if you improve your sustainability and you get certification, you may have a secured market and a stable income. And you may also have a higher income due to premiums. But we heard, or, we heard already from Pak Dupito that um, the secured market is very much uh, related to the global market. So if nobody buys your certified uh, oil palm, this doesn't work and the premium will not come to you. So it is very important to see that the connection as well between upgrading in the supply chain and also uh, improving quality of your product and getting a fair price in the global market. So the third way of upgrading is functional upgrading. And that means farmers will do more activities within the supply chain. You see here a picture of the supply chain. You see the plot and the plot needs seeds and inputs and labor. These have to be provided by someone that wants to make money. If it is the company that has to provide it, it will cost them money. 
if the farmers make it happen themselves, we can save money. The same goes for grading, transport, aggregation. If the company is responsible for that, the farmers have to pay for it. But if the farmers are responsible for that, they can even capture more value in the chain. And another way to capture more value in the chain is to become a shareholder of the mill, for instance, by which the output of the mill and the revenues will also uh, partly come back to the farmers. So functional upgrading means that within the supply chain, farmers, either alone or as organizations, try to do more services, more aspects, and then also try to increase their ownership over the assets and thereby capture more value, which can increase their income. The fourth upgrading type is improving value chain coordination. Value chain coordination has to do with contracts, with agreements between buyers and sellers. It has to do with farmer organizations to uh, try to improve your bargaining power. And if the coordination works well, it can secure a market, both for the farmers, for the farmers but it can also secure supply for the buyers and can lead to a higher and stable income. So I think the four types of uh, upgrading can all contribute to more inclusiveness for smallholders. Um, for companies, it's also a good idea. It will reduce cost because uh, we have volume of, uh, we have economy of scale because of large volumes. Uh, the companies need to provide less services, less material, less manpower, and they don't need to search actively anymore for supplies if they are in a partnership. It may also reduce waste streams. If quality of the product goes up, then the waste stream at the mill goes down. And also we have much less rejected uh, uh, food bunches, which is also waste. So you get a higher and more homogeneous quality for the mill and uh, reduced waste streams. Uh, X, it will, uh, upgrading will provide access to certification and premium markets and uh, contracting can allow for traceability. And um, upgrading will decrease supply and quality risks because uh, if you have upgrading and you have uh, partnerships and uh, coordination in the chain, you have known and committed suppliers. So that is less risky than just having to search for your food bunches everywhere. So I think it's a good thing for both smallholders and for uh, companies. A second point I want to raise, I have limited time, but the second point I want to raise is that uh, Oil palm production is dominantly uh, promoted as a monoculture. And we see more and more that farmers try to make it more um, diverse. And it is possible. So we are doing research on uh, integration of oil palm with other crops and with uh, animals. And we have found, and we did an extensive literature research, that temporary uh, intercropping as replanting, so up till five years after uh, planting the oil palm, you can put annual crops there, corn, pineapple, banana, peanut, and the palm will not suffer. So the yield of the palm will be the same as if it was a monoculture. But for farmers, it's very important because it can fill the income gap till the palm starts yielding. For permanent intercropping, which we also see in the field, so you can see some pictures uh, next to it, um, you need to adjust your planting pattern. The palm will have so much shade that it will be very difficult to put permanently uh, something in between. And then you can choose for annual crops or perennial crops. And for perennial crops, uh, cacao and black pepper are good candidates. Permanent intercropping means that farmers have a continuous support to household and food, in, food and income. And it will also decrease their dependency on just one market. And if I come back again to the first presentation for, from Mr. Dupito, it shows that if the international market for oil palm is, is difficult, if you have a permanent intercrop, you can still rely on the other market for your other crop. So it may be a risk avoiding uh, strategy. Uh, two other ways of integration are still uh, possible. One is oil palm with uh, timber trees or fruit trees. It also happens in reality. Uh, there's a, a picture there from Jambi. We have to be a bit cautious there because there's a strong competition and it can potentially reduce both the tree growth, but also the oil palm yields. So more research is needed on planting patterns that will really accommodate both crops. Of course, if you plant a very high value tree in your oil palm and you have a small reduction on your yield, you may not bother too much because then the revenue of your second crop will, will uh, compensate for the 
a loss in uh, palm oil, but I can uh, assume that um, companies are not very happy when uh, palm oil will reduce in uh, yield. So it is also something to be negotiated. Finally, we see oil palm livestock uh, integration, mainly rotational grazing. Uh, the palm trees have to be over eight years old, else the, the cattle, at least, they will eat all the leaves from the palm, which is not what you want. Uh, the quality and quantity of weeds has been shown to support animal growth, so it is really possible. And you can also think of using byproducts like uh, palm kernel meal to feed your uh, animals. And this is typically an investment, like also the timber trees and cattle, they are both investments because you will not have daily or regularly income, but only once when you sell the animals which is a difference between the uh, annual uh, crops that uh, give you uh, once a year an income and uh, perennial crops like cacao and black pepper gives you also some income uh, several times per year. So for the discussion, I think uh, upgrade upgrading uh, has been shown to have benefits both for smallholders and other supply chain actors. And integrated systems seem to fit better to smallholders' livelihoods and needs, as smallholders already do it, but they don't do it in a very uh, organized way. So we may as assist them. And for the discussion, why is it not happening everywhere and what is needed to make it happen? So thank you for your interest. There are a few reading uh, materials here. And as this is all recorded, you can have a look at it uh, closely uh, afterwards. So thank you so much. Um, after this presentation, um, we will continue with the presentation by uh, Itzhet Jelsma. You have noticed that uh, both uh, Diana and myself, we also tried to put some um, theory in the presentation and we had limited time to give examples, but Itzhet will share with us a, a, a case study in which uh, all these things come together. So Itzhet, uh, I will... Uh, give an introduction to you, but you can perhaps start sharing your screen. Uh, it's in the Elsma finishes master's in Sorry, Maya. Maya, you have yeah. to uh, click away your um, presentation okay. first before yeah. I can share this. I do, I did. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, after finishing his master's, it's started to work at the plant production system groups in uh, Wageningen University on smallholder involvement in several agro commodities. And one of these researchers focused on collective action in a smallholder oil palm plantation in West Sumatra. And he has frequently visited that plantation since, and he will talk about it today. Um, it started his PhD in 2013 on the role of smallholders in sustainable and inclusive palm oil production in Indonesia at Utrecht University. And uh, I can tell you, he showed the high diversity of smallholders in his study. He was hosted by the Center for International Forestry Research, C4 in Bogor, and completed his dissertation in, in 2019. During and after his studies, Itzhut has been involved in several freelance consultancies for SMV, C4, Trocombos, Indonesia, Climate Focus, etc., and he's eager to continue this work. So Itzhut will share with us a case study, and uh, you will see that all the components discussed before will come together. So Itzhut, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Maya. Uh, I will touch upon all these topics, not all of them, but um, some of the topics we discussed. Um, my topic will be collective action. It was an important component of my dissertation, and I will present a, a case study as mentioned before. However, first briefly mention what is collective action. Uh, there's a lot of literature already on this topic, but basically it's people and institutions working together to achieve a common objective together. However, although this sounds really easy, uh, in practice it's, it's quite difficult because individuals always have their, their own priorities. Uh, they might go for short-term ter benefits and these challenge the, uh, the collective objectives which we have, as, uh, which, which people have together. Also, uh, yeah, aligned to this is the free rider problem which means that people often want to benefit from the collective action, but they actually want to contribute as little as possible. Now, there are, uh, there's theory about how to reduce these things. There are design principles, how to set up uh, collective action properly. Uh, but in, in many cases, I worked out about successful collective action, but it's also clear that there are no uh, blueprints and there are no guarantees for success. Um, 
what is the relevance for the Indonesian oil palm sector? It's clear that there are uh, performance issues. Smallholders are generally producing a lot less than companies. There is a, a big yield gap. And also, uh, smallholders are often included on the most adverse terms uh, into, the, into the oil palm value chain. Now, collective action can create the advantages of scale. And I show a small table from Poulton who, who uh, shows the differences or the advantages from large farms uh, compared to small farms. And you can see market knowledge, market access, technical knowledge, uh, how, purchasing inputs together, accessing finance, uh, selling of produce, and of course, becoming more and more important is also traceability and quality assurance. Um, however, there are also, uh, Poulton also mentions the advantages of smallholder agriculture, and I think these are important for, for oil palm smallholders as well, which is that they need uh, relatively little supervision and their motivation and knowledge of the actual uh, plantation can be much better compared to plantation companies where monitoring is more difficult. Um, as mentioned, there are increasing requirements by sustainability initiatives, by financing institutions, etc., uh, by the government, the Indonesian government, for uh, people to um, Hello? Yeah? Hello? We are still there. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, intervention. I have to minimize this again. Um, okay, so indeed there are also advantages of smallholder agriculture and we need to keep them in mind. As uh, Diana already mentioned, replanting is a huge issue, a huge challenge for smallholders. And with collective action, it might be possible to arrange this in a better, uh, in a more efficient manner. Um, I will present the Ophir case. It's a plantation where they experienced collective action for over 40 years now. It's a, yeah, the plantation uh, consists of 8,000 hectares, nearly 8,000 hectares, 3,000 or 3,200 hectares of uh, nucleus estate and 4,800 hectares of smallholders who were initially um, supported by the nucleus estate. These uh, 4,800 hectares um, have 2,400 farmers on them, individual farmers, and these farmers are responsible for, um, for applying the fertilizers, the weeding and tending the plantation, uh, harvesting their plantations and all these kinds of things. Now, the first level of collective action comes at group level. So these farmers are organizing groups. Each groups is a, group is about 25 uh, families, 25 farmers, uh, and cover, thus covers about uh, 50 hectares. Now at this level, yeah, you see that the farmers combine their incomes and they have a shared income. Um, and th this creates interdependence between farmers. And so we see these farmers uh, checking each other's work, whether the standards are uh, up to, uh, whether performance is up to standards. Um, at the group level, uh, there will be disciplining measures, but uh, when people are not doing their, uh, their work like they're supposed to do, um, they have discussions about the rules and regulations, uh, how should people do their, uh, their, their work, what, um, what, what are the fines, what is the uh, sanctioning uh, if people don't do their work. But in the end, it's the head of the cooperative uh, Kelompok or the group who takes care, their work is always done up to standards, was always done up to standards, and uh, farmers were deducted if they did not deducted uh, or in, 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 yeah, received fines or got deductions when the head of the group uh, hired somebody to do the work in the plantation. At the level above, you have the cooperatives, and each cooperative uh, consists of about 20 groups, has about 1,000 hectares of plantations, and these organized activities, which were more difficult to organize at the individual level or at the group level. And that means they organized transportation to the mills, they organized um, joint purchases of fertilizers, uh, they distributed that to the Kolompok again, and the Kolompok distributed it to the farmers. 
Uh, also, the cooperatives granted credits to the smallholders. The groups also could credit, uh, grant credits to the smallholders. And um, yeah, and, and, and they also have a technical unit for technical support to smallholders. So if the road needs to be repaired, it's the cooperative who arranges road repairs in the, in the, in the, in the plantation. Now above that, unifying all smallholders and then unifying all five cooperatives, there is a supra cooperative which coordinates activities between the cooperatives, but also negotiates with third parties as the mill, for example, about prices, about and other things that, that the smallholders as a whole might need external assistance from. Uh, this was pretty successful. You see here the uh, the, the yields of uh, smallholders. Uh, they were far above. Yeah, some some. Um, yeah, the, the the yields are high as you can see here. Uh, many years above 25 hectares uh, tons per hectare. Often in a cooperative one, uh, even above 30 hectares per per year. And the black line you see there is the uh, company PTPN6, and they perform much less than the smallholders. And that's probably because of these advantages of smallholder agriculture and large scale agricultures were combined through collective action. Now, the collectives were changing. And um, of course there's one plantation, but you see the number of actors involved in collective action changing over time. When the, uh, the, the line above, the first line uh, row, uh, shows uh, is, is the getting started phase more or less. And you see that there is a large collective. There is the Indonesian uh, Peer Nest program, uh, which is supporting a certain setup of smallholder plantations. There is a foreign uh, development organization which invests heavily in, um, in setting up an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a successful smallholder plantation. Uh, there is uh, the provincial a coordination committee which organizes all kinds of uh, government bodies at provincial and local level into collectively making sure that the over smallholder uh, plantation becomes an engine of rural development in that area and it functions well and the farmers are getting uh, proper incomes from their uh, plantations. There are many at that level in those early years 1980 to 1996 there are uh, over 50 extension workers in the field and farmers are well supported. Once it's on the road, uh, the second phase is on the road. Uh, and then you see that that uh, many that the collective, all those actors are shrink that that jointly make the uh, Ophir plantations is shrinking. The German development organization is leaving. The uh, Nespeer program uh, is, is finished basically government or state actors are retreating. There is less support for smallholders. And, and these things are fine. I mean, it's not, not a real problem because it's on the road and people are producing nicely and the institutions are in place. So it all keeps working. The farmers have their own armadas of uh, trucks driving to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, plant, to the mill and, uh, and, and their, their plantations are neatly managed in general. Uh, during this time, we also see the larger expansion of the oil palm uh, landscape in West Sumatra. Whereas in the beginning, there were no alternatives for farmers to sell their produce elsewhere. You see now that there are increasing alternatives. There are more mills being established. There are independent mills, there are independent farmers. Still, farmers see the advantages of collective action and choose to stay within their uh, collectives, within their um, um, organizations, their collective action. And that, that remains nearly 100% till at least 2010. Um, so these individuals, they make their choices to stay within the collective. They have their land certificates. So actually they have the opportunity to go out. They could leave, but they choose to stay in. There is collective decision-making there. Farmers um, make decisions about about they agree upon the, uh, the programs that the cooperative presents to them. The fertilizer uh, procurement is done yearly. Uh, they have to agree to these purchases and uh, there are yearly plans in place to uh, take care of that, that everything runs smoothly. However, 
uh, we also see collective decision making that the rules are changing at all these these different uh, levels and the, these different organizations. For example, in Cooperative Three, they start having discussions about the position of land, of uh, land certificates, and the voice of the people of the smallholders. Uh, they, they say, hey, we want our land certificates returned. That's okay, and the land certificates are returned to the individual farmers who can then use them to, uh, to, to, to get loans or whatever at normal banks. That's, at that stage, these things are not an issue. Um, also, they are saving money for replanting. However, the voice of smallholders in cooperatives two, three, four, and five are demanding uh, they're replanting uh, money earlier in advance because they are having difficulties, experiencing difficulties and demand their savings to counter their current uh, problems. So that's voice, but it's, it's threatening the uh, collective as we will see later. Because at the end of the on the road phase around 2010, you see that the farms are, uh, the oil palms are getting old. 25, 30 years old already, you see declining yields. And not only are the yields declining, the oil content is also declining. So there is lower, uh, lower uh, income because of uh, lower prices. And they also receive lower income because of lower yields. And that's why they ask for the replanting funds in advance. Some of them ask for it. In cooperative one, you see that the management is able to stop uh, farmers from demanding these, uh, these, these replanting funds. And they are able to uh, maintain the replanting funds and they are able to maintain the, the, the land certificates within their organization. And thereby they have more collateral for the replanting phase. During the replanting phase, you see that there is limited external support. The development organization is not helping anymore. The government is not uh, providing much assistance in the, during the replanting phase, like in the first phase when they were getting started. Um, and also banks are really difficult in providing them loans. Um, you see that the first cooperative is able to secure a loan because they have collateral, they have a good track record and they have savings and, and, and they are off to an, uh, a professional replanting, meaning excavators who do the replanting, collective felling of oil palms, uh, proper collective purchases of planting materials and uh, uh, yeah, manage and, and planting it collectively. Uh, you see there that only 10% eventually leaves the cooper cooperative. Um, however, oh, sorry, I need to go to farmer heterogeneity. Um, at the end of the on the road session, the farmer heterogeneity, heterogeneity becomes obvious. And that's when the, the difficulty in voice begins. What is smallholder voice? Because you have older farmers or poorer farmers who cannot afford to stop getting the income that they have from their old palm, uh, palms. So they don't want to go for replanting. However, you also have richer farmers or other farmers with other priorities who state, hey, I want to replant as soon as possible because they, I'm not getting enough yields and I have, want to get the replanting phase over with. So you get all these conflicts within uh, uh, these, these, these farmer organizations. Uh, also about the strategies, what to do? Do you want to do it collectively in one time with a loan or do you want to uh, do it individually with your own money? And you see that Cooperatives two, three, four, and five are unable to come up with the finances and a decent plan to provide a professional uh, replanting. And farmers have to do it individually or in smaller groups. And you see that the collective action is falling apart at a time when actually it's most needed. And those are the, divi uh, the diverting pathways. There are a lot of alternatives during this period. Indeed, farmers can leave the cooperatives and sell every, uh, somewhere else. There are enough uh, dealers around who they can buy uh, planting materials from. And generally speaking, they start with underplanting as a replanting strategy, taking the, the last bits from the uh, old oil palms and planting underneath 
uh, new young oil palms which grow quite poorly because there's too much shade to develop properly. But it's a cheap strategy. So there is one business model, but there is a very different outcomes. What you see here is, uh, is the five cooperatives. Green is cooperative one, uh, yellow is cooperative two, etc. And you can see that, that the yields or the incomes, the gross incomes are uh, quite high with cooperative one, and they are quite low with um, cooperative three. And that's where the risk and the, uh, and the reward issues that uh, Diana mentioned come in. For those farmers in cooperative three, um, there is almost no reward anymore. I mean, they, they receive very little money. Whereas in the, the um, yeah, how to describe this, these little triangles on the top, they indicate how much the gross profit from their oil palm is. And the uh, bar, the bars show the spread of net uh, transfers to farmers. And then you can see that for farmers in cooperative three, for example, there are hardly any uh, transfers to the farmers anymore. Therefore, for them, there is hardly a benefit anymore for staying in their cooperative. And it's good for them to, to leave the cooperatives and their groups <laughs> and not having to repay your debts and, um, and, and benefiting from as much income as possible uh, by directly selling to the other one. And below, you can see the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the decreases in rates till 2009. Almost everybody was part of the uh, co uh, cooperatives and collectives. And in 2018, you see a massive, uh, yeah, people massively leaving the cooperatives, except for cooperative one, where numbers remained really high, and cooperative four, which is has been planted a bit later. So it needs to be seen whether they remain these numbers or how they go through their replanting phase. Anyway. What this case shows is that um, collective action can lead to the combination of uh, smallholder the advantages of smallholder agriculture, as well as the small uh, advantages of large scale agriculture, but it does not happen uh, by itself. It needed a lot of external input. So for collective action to succeed, you need to invest and acknowledge that there needs to be considerable institutional development rules and regulations. People have to understand why and uh, how they will benefit from doing things collectively. You need proper leadership in, and you need uh, to build trust in your organizations. Leadership, yeah, it's difficult to train. I mean, we see many times that, that some organizations just have good leaders and other organizations just don't have the, the, the leaders to step up and lead their organizations. Important, farmers must see their, their benefits. Ownership, voice, risk, reward, all these things are important. But it's also important to acknowledge the diversity in landscapes and among smallholders. And there is, their, their voice becomes an issue. Whose voice? Uh, the diversity of smallholders. Some smallholders might indeed want to go for intercropping systems, which, um, which, which spread the risk, spread the risk whilst other richer farmers might want to go for monocultures in which they, 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 there might be more risk, but the rewards might be bigger as well. So all these things you need to acknowledge when, doing, when, when wanting to create um, collective action. It's clear that there are considerable uh, uh, costs involved. Uh, all these actors I, I mentioned in the setting up of the OFER project, it costs a lot of money, uh, time and effort. Conditions are clearly changing all the time, and thus it needs continuous work. The Ophir plantation was established. It ran nicely for a while, but then it was left. Farmers were just left with a critical event of replanting, and nobody helped them out, really. And I think that's a point where you need continuous work, where the continuous work comes in, and you need to, 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 change, uh, yeah, to create the enabling conditions for them to, to, to replant. Uh, you need to do this, create these enabling conditions at all levels, at multiple levels. You need to do it with the farmers, so you need to provide proper trainings on how to manage cooperatives, how, how to deal with group processes, um, how to have a transparent um, transparency in your in your uh, yeah, transparency and accountability, showing your books so that your farmers know 
uh, that they are um, that they're not being tricked. Maintain confidence by the farmers that they are doing that your leaders are doing a good job. At the landscape level, you see that um, that that governments need to support these farmers. Uh, they need to create the environment in which farmers and farmer organizations can get access to knowledge, to support, institutional support, etc. And I think this is, there is a role for companies here, and there is a role for government, and of course also for NGOs and uh, civil society. And there is the last bit, the national and the international level. Uh, there are great international initiatives. The RSPO is setting up its, its smallholder academy. How, how well is this going to connect with the, uh, with the local level and the national level also? There are all these nice plans that the, the Indonesian government is having some nice plans in, in, in place, but the translation and the coordination with the local level uh, requires quite some effort. So there are many interesting developments going on. Uh, I think organizations like Inobu and, and SPKS for TASPI are doing wonderful jobs at the, at the, on the ground, but is it enough to truly change that massive oil palm sector? And I think that, uh, yeah, an issue is clearly that, that um, people are not buying enough sustainable palm oil. And can we really get enough people involved in, in collective action to truly change the sector as a whole? Um, thank you very much. Uh, there's more detailed information more structured information in my dissertation. Uh, you can Google it. And for more questions, please uh, send me an email. It's a thank you very much. It's really uh, nice to see that at some moment in time, collective action was able to capture more value in the chain to upgrading, to capture, uh, to, to assist in having voice, rewards, etc. It's also um, clear that we need a lot of support. To, to get this collective action going and to capture all these uh, advantages. And I think it's also important what you stressed and that is also stressed by Diana that heterogeneity of smallholders is quite key and that the voice of one is not the same as the voice of another. So it's a bit naive to think that we just give communities or smallholders voice. We always have to, to look whose voice and in the interest of whom. So thank you very much for this, uh, this nice uh, case study. And I really advise people to read the dissertation. It's really very interesting stuff to read. So um, we have, as last, we have uh, Pak Bayo Krishna Murti, who uh, who will reflect on uh, on the issues that we uh, that we had. Um, I will introduce him uh, briefly. Pak uh, Bayo Krishna Murti is the founder of the Inclusive and Sustainable Every Business Initiatives at IPB University. He is a chairperson of IPB University SDGs Network, Sustainable Development Goals. They were also mentioned in the first presentation. He is a chairperson of Indonesian Agribusiness Association and chair of the advisory board of Indonesia Agricultural Economist Association. And he is also the former president director of Indonesia Estate Crop Fund. And there were some people already asking and talking about uh, replanting. So I think uh, that is also interesting, uh, could be also interesting to, to, to talk to um, Pak Bayo about. And uh, this fund was from the Ministry of Finance, of course. So uh, Pak Bayo, uh, please, can you uh, share your uh, thoughts with us? I don't know if you have a presentation. If so, can you share your screen? And if not, can you just deliver your speech, please? Thank you, uh, Maya. Uh, thank you, friends and colleagues. I see uh, many familiar names in, in the participants. Uh, I think uh, yeah, many of them is actually more experienced than me in terms of palm oil. I see the name of uh, Wichaksono uh, in there. He's the colleagues of uh, Dupito. Uh, Wichaksono is a director for small holders in the uh, Sipopsi. Uh, let me share my uh, Foundations. It's only just a few, a few slides, and uh, I think I would like to congratulate uh, all the all the speakers, uh, previous speakers, that you already touched on uh, so many issues uh, within the the, the 
inclusive or inclusiveness issues with uh, small farmers of plant uh, of uh, palm oil. But I would like to uh, probably provoke you to, you know, try to to fly a little bit higher and to to have a kind of bird view on the of the supply chain, the total supply chains of the palm oil. First, of course, this is a, a, an always a, a debate and a discussion. What do we mean by inclusiveness? Is it inclusive, inclusivity, inclusions? Yeah, so many terms, but probably we could say that inclu inclusiveness is not exclusiveness. And uh, exclusiveness, uh, probably people might think about uh, only big companies or one big companies uh, existing in agriculture supply chains. Uh, maybe it's also interesting if we have an exclusiveness of only small farmers existing in agriculture supply chain. Will, it, will that be an exclusiveness? I don't know. Uh, yes, uh, because uh, uh, I'm from the SDG network, I think inclusiveness is very, very important for SDGs. Uh, at least six of the seven things of the SDGs been touched by inclusiveness uh, uh, through uh, uh, business opportunity, employment creation, technological improvement, productivity impro um, uh, improvement, and uh, et cetera, and so forth. And about six, as I said, uh, no poverty, reduce inequalities, uh, decent work and economic growth, climate actions, peace and justice, and partnership. So. Just basically, inclusiveness is important and very important and strategic. And I would like to argue that this is not the question of whether or not inclusiveness or inclusivity is, is there. That is not the question. The question is, I think uh, it's a touch on that and probably also uh, Maya and Diana said I think uh, uh, very clearly, inclus inclusiveness, uh, one inclusiveness and the other inclusiveness is different. So the question is the quality of the inclusivity or the quality of the inclusiveness. I think that's that's uh, what my 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 uh, uh, approach. Uh, Maya mentions that. Probably it's good not only talk about palm oil, then give the perspective of other uh, commodities. This is just uh, uh, one slide that probably could show that. Indonesian agribusiness is by nature an inclusive one uh, within this context. And we can see, for example, in rice, the on-farm activities is done by, by small farmers. Probably there is no big companies in, in on-farm, but those Small farmers very much depend on the input come from the big company, which is uh, on the agro input. And the, the agro processing is still 40, now, and it is growing uh, 40 percent, about 40 percent of the agro processing is come from the big companies. And the sales and retails also about 40 percent. So we cannot, we, we should not only see inclusiveness within one aspect of the supply chain which is the on-farm. We need also to see inclusiveness uh, 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 on the whole supply chain system. For palm oil, for example, yes, on-farm is about 45% uh, uh, contributed by small farmers. But within the agro input, the small farmers in probably only, uh, contribute less than 10%. In agro processing, even less. It's only about 2%. Sales and retails about 11, 10% also. So if we look at the whole uh, supply chains, then it's, it's different. Uh, it's not, uh, 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 you know, it's not only uh, like uh, small, small farmers and big plantations. It's uh, total, totally different games, but we know that uh, uh, the supply chains is, uh, actually uh, the one who make money, right? This is uh, uh, just to elaborate on that uh, uh, table. Uh, 
Inclusiveness is a multifaceted model. This is a horticulture on potatoes, a very specific on potatoes. You can see all the arrow is on more on the agro processing and sales side. The on farm is basically almost exclusive. The, the, the on farm, there is no transaction between uh, uh, on farm from the big companies uh, with uh, on farm from the small farm, uh, farmers or, or, or micro enterprises. There is no transactions, but there is a lot of activities within the agro processing. The big companies agro processing is depend on the uh, output from on farm uh, come from the small farmers, vice versa. Right? So I think there is a new a different dimension within this context compare for example, palm oil. Because within palm oil, uh, more activities is within the on-farm and agro-processing. Almost, you know, as I've been mentioned before, there is almost none of the uh, small uh, or micro-enterprises agro-processing, very, very small. The reason why is, of course, purely economics. It's this uh, economies of scale. So uh, the on-farm, uh, the, the press brand, fruit from the on farm of the small farmers have to go, has to go to go to uh, agro processing because there is no alternative in that, in that in aspect. Some of the, the TBS, the, the fresh uh, fruits is also go to the on farm of the big companies and the big companies go to the processing and so forth. So uh, uh, inclusivity, or inclusiveness arrangement related with institutional arrangement, which is the, the relation between small farmers and big companies, is more on this side. And there is so many uh, variety. There is a nucleoplasma arrangement. There is independent contracted partnering arrangement. There is an independent non-partnering and so forth. So the dynamic, I think, is fast within this uh, uh, inclusiveness model. Having saying that, we have also have to recognize the complexity of the supply uh, chain system. The money come from this chocolate bar, right? The money come from the consumers and the consumer buy this chocolate bar. And where this chocolate bar come from is the whole, you know, chains of activities and businesses. And the, 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 the face that I put on red dots is where there are some mixed uh, sources of, of product come to that, to that point. So again, the dynamic of the, this inclusivity within the supply chains is not, it's, it's very complex as well. Uh, we cannot just, for example, if, if we talk about voices, if we talk about uh, risks, do we talk about only in the in the plantation level? Do we or, or we, we we discuss that on the uh, the mix of the fruits or uh, uh, on the crude palm oil uh, 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 tankers and uh, refinery? So because there is so many uh, variety uh, within the supply chains, and if we uh, uh, put uh, reward as one of the component of the uh, uh, inclusiveness, then we have to look on this uh, uh, complex uh, supply chain system. Now, uh, I can put uh, 10 slides for every point that I make here, but I don't have the time for that. But I think, again, I would like to put, to put my, my uh, point that the question is, again, I think it's consistent with what Maya mentions and also is that as already and Diana, that how we improve the quality of that inclusiveness, that the inclusivity or the inclusiveness is there, but how we inc increase the quality. I put nine, at least nine issues related with that. First, compatibility. We cannot say that the uh, product from farmer's garden is 100% is compatible with a product from company plantations. And within the agriculture or the agro-industry system, compatibility, consistency of product, quality of product is key, is critical. If not, then there will be costs uh, that have to be paid. So 
how to maintain to uh, improve the quality of product so they can be uh, in, in the same level. Progress of technology and operations. Uh, the company, uh, uh, because uh, uh, because of the the needs of the consumers, because the the message from the consumer side, they have a quite rapid progress uh, on their technology and how they operate. Can the small farmers uh, follow that progress and that rapidness? There are also issue of legality. Uh, Within the this compatibility or within the the combat, uh, the uh, inclusiveness of big and small companies, from this come trust. You the big company trust the farmers, or the farmers trust the big companies. I would like to point out that all of this issue is not only one way; it's a two way situations. Trust come need to come from both sides. Fairness. And of course, uh, uh, the, uh, that is very much related with reward, uh, reward and prices. But what what do we mean by by fairness? Because, for example, cost of the supply chains and non-product expenses in palm oil is about sixty percent. So we cannot just say that uh, the the, uh, the the product from uh, uh, fresh uh, fruit from the small farmers forty percent, then the big company sixty percent then it has to be uh, 40, 60. How about the whole other uh, costs in the supply chain? Voices, I totally agree with this. And I think this is very, very important, but how we to do it? Yes, probably we can see as a, a case study by Isar, within the plantation is e more, more easily uh, pictured how this voice can be improved, but within the total supply chains, that is, Another, another story, another different story. Distribution of risk and uncertainty. Yes, again, this is also uh, things that need to be discussed because without, without understanding that, for, for example, the, the fluctuation of the price, and we have to know that that price is actually uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the end of the supply chains, then we need to, to uh, be able to, to uh, distribute that. Uh, uh, fairly, again, uh, issue of fairness. Honoring contractual arrangement. Yes, contract can be a an, uh, an good instrument, but both sides, again, need to be honoring that arrangement. And I think this is something that uh, uh, still very difficult to find, a dispute resolution mechanism. The, the smallholders and big companies probably have the different opinion because they have uh, their own interests, then we need to come to a kind of mechanism how to, to resolve it, how to, to, to uh, put that on, uh, you know, give an answer. I totally agree with that about the importance of cooperative. Farmer institution is very, very strategic. And um, um, yeah, uh, this institution have their own, their own uh, challenge, but uh, again, to improve the, uh, the quality of the inclusiveness, we have to accommodate uh, how to uh, improve the cooperative. And of course, now there are certifications, there are um, uh, traceability issues, etc. So these third party factors can also, uh, uh, government uh, policy, etc., can also uh, affect the, the relationship between uh, small farmers and uh, big companies within the supply chains. So if we look in this, our condition now, the palm oil is less affected by COVID, uh, then I think this is a good opportunity, it's a, a good moment to build forward better. And uh, that, that means to improve and uh, the quality of this nine, at least this nine, point that I did mention. Just to, to, to you know, to, to end our, uh, uh, my presentation and to, to for, for us to take uh, it probably back home. This is, I think this, this, <coughs> sorry, this picture is a very, <laughs> it's a kind of punch in the line. 
warning this is an inclusive society uh you uh, uh if we think you are talking thinking or behaving in non inclusive way <laughs> you will exclude it so that inclusivity means there is no uh, uh, differentiations thank you okay. thank you Pabayu. I think uh, we all noticed that we have had very interesting presentation and this uh, presentation again showed different aspects to take into consideration, including the complexity of the supply chain. And um, we have uh, limited time for questions. So I propose we go straight to the questions. Uh, Dupito, can you also put on your camera? I will see there are quite some questions uh, for you. And we can start for that one, perhaps. Uh, one uh, really intriguing question is you have the CPOPC and several uh, participants asked, did, um, how, how do smallholders be represented? And are NGOs and other partners also part of this uh, CPOPC? And the second question is, um, as it is among countries, did you learn already something from policies from other countries that will foster smallholder inclusiveness? Uh, thank you, Maya. Um, uh, thank you for the questions uh, addressed to me. I think uh, from uh, Pahero Komarudin and also Andrew and you yeah. Pancha. And I think there was uh, one also uh, from uh, Solidaridad Indonesia. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, a specific question from uh, Andrew from Sierra Leone. I think it is very interesting because uh, he raised uh, uh, you know, the possibility of uh, CPOPC engaging governments more. And uh, uh, by doing so, uh, you know, the, the CPOPC and the you know, relevant governments can you know, uh, uh, in a way uh, uh, also uh, promote cooperation and partnership with uh, smallholders in that country. I think that is the whole idea why we had, uh, you know, uh, we, we plan to have uh, the, the summit uh, last month and also soon we'll have a, an out, outreach program. The question is Maya, uh, since uh, now uh, you understand that uh, only two countries are members of CPOPC, Indonesia and Malaysia, but three countries have already applied formally, that is Ghana, Colombia and also Honduras. But without waiting for uh, governments to, to apply to CPOPC, uh, CPOPC will make this uh, arrangement on how to, to outreach to, uh, to smallholders in, in many producing countries. I think that is the whole intention. I will, will start uh, the first program uh, next month, hopefully. Uh, um, the director, he is here with me. And the second point is about, uh, I think there was also a, a question addressed to me on sustainability. Is there uh, you know something that CPOPC has already done, including working with NGOs and also you know, uh, other stakeholders to develop sustainability standards. And of course, uh, if you look at the charter, uh, one of the functions, the main functions of SPOPC is to develop global framework for, uh, for principles of sustainability of palm oil. It means that uh, we need to develop these principles. We have advice uh, because we are representing the secretariat. We have advised the, the, the governments, the two member countries to establish uh, a specific working group in order to discuss about the principles of sustainability. Although, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, there was also some suggestion from uh, some stakeholders that uh, you know, there are so many uh, 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 certifications already for palm oil, including ESCO for Indonesia and MSPO for Malaysia, both are mandatory. And of course, uh, we understand also there is a other, other certification system such as RSPO, but uh, then, uh, I think there was a request also that other vegetable oils should also have uh, the uh, similar or the, uh, the same sustainability standard to be applied. So that is uh, one thing. I think there is one uh, one question from from uh, sorry, uh, Pastor Pastor Pito. Pancha. I think uh, we have limited time, so I want okay. also other people to to uh, answer right. some questions okay. because I I had uh, four questions, but again uh, yeah, from Solidarity you... Indonesia, if you give me one 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 minute. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Solidaridad Indonesia, my good friend uh, Kulbir, Kulbir uh, Mehta raised uh, the, you know, the NISCOPs again. Again, yeah. uh, I think it will be good if the EU can also be part of this kind of partnership 
but of course, not just to provide technical assistance, but also to, to promote partnership, to discuss with us what is the sustainability standard, uh, you know, acceptable to the EU. We should develop it together because uh, like, uh, you know, in, in my tweets, I mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, it will be it will be interesting to to know the, the comments of uh, Italy and Italians if Asia develops sustainability standard for mozzarella. So, so again, uh, we have to be part of this uh, whole process. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, there are also quite some questions for uh, Diana, and one uh, one that uh, came to mind is uh, certification seems to raise uh, all the four. Um, uh, um, Inclusiveness uh, factors, but uh, are there additional measurements necessary to necessary to uh, raise them more? And is it the only way to uh, to get this more uh, this higher uh, scores? Diana. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, I think yes, certification. If we keep, if we see it from the short term uh, concern, uh, certifications, uh, whether it's uh, is uh, the local certification, like national certification, like uh, MSPO is for or RSPO, they already accommodate the uh, four components, although uh, different level in each of the certification. But in fact, that uh, there is a very uh, unclear, uh, unclear uh, indicators or targets. Uh, related to the uh, short, uh, the long-term plan, uh, we know that uh, palm oil is a long-term uh, business. So, for example, if we if we already, if the smallholders have already fulfilled the whole PNC, they still have uh, difficulties in uh, doing the replanting. It means that uh, there is no exact certain. Uh, guidance for them to engage in the long-term path. Uh, in the uh, newest um, RSPO 2019 certification, they tried to uh, raise that, but very, uh, a very small part of that uh, uh, concerning about the long-term plan. But uh, before that, the long term is only uh, refers to three or five years uh, financial plan, which is really not enough for certification. So I think uh, PNC uh, or certification could be improved with uh, more, uh, uh, what do you call that, closer to the characteristic, the long term characteristic of uh, palm oil. That's, I think that's my uh, reply. Thank you very much. There are quite some people that ask uh, Itzit whether he has seen uh, spontaneous, spontaneous collective action that works, so without all this uh, external uh, support, and also um, whether we can, what, what is needed to re replicate the OV case. Okay, about spontaneous, um, spontaneous collective action, there is, there is a whole literature about that. So in other cases, there is a, there is a lot of literature. Ostrom uh, writes about this already in the 90s. So there's plenty of literature on spontaneous um, collective action. Actually, that will be the vast majority. Um, but, but this was indeed, this was externally imposed actually, which makes it extra interesting because it was successful for quite a while. The point is, however, that I, I am very interested to see what's going to happen now in Ophir, and I will go later again, uh, later in this year, because uh, we already see that, that, um, that, that some members of former cooperatives organized in another cooperative again. So they left one cooperative and they started another one. And of course, during replanting, you don't need a whole armada of trucks to, to, to support your, uh, your, your production system. But now that they have replanted, I'm very curious what's going to pop up again. And I'm, sh I'm certain there will be collective action. I think it's a missed opportunity that the replanting did not happen collectively. Uh, and and I, I will check uh, whether the planting material they used is proper quality, uh, proper planting material. But I'm sure that there will be new forms of collective action. So I'm very interested to see what's happening. I think there is, 
uh, I think other organizations will know more about where spontaneous collective action emerges, but that is the, 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 the minority. I mean, if you go out into Indonesia, into many islands, I went into to, to many of the provinces in Kalimantan and Sumatra, in general, you don't see strong farmer organizations popping up that organically. They exist, but it's not very common. I hope that answers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, in the, for the sake of time, I think uh, we have uh, the following option now. We can uh, we can close formally and then we can still hang on if people want to discuss more questions. The other option is that we uh, we can answer questions in the in the chat individually. Sorry, in the Q and A. So um, I think we promise to be here till. 11.30, so I suggest we, we do the formal closure and then afterwards those that want can still continue discussing. Is that uh, possible, uh, Diana? Sure, that's possible, but I think that uh, uh, we can also like sharing uh, our emails if uh, because there are there are questions that I think needs more detail. It's very yeah. like it will come with uh, uh, misleading uh, understanding if we just like uh, have a quick response for that. So we are trying to give like a clear uh, perception or understanding about the inclusivity. So if we only give like quick uh, response, might uh, not clear clarify it rather than we make a, a new problems with that. Okay. I, I, think so. I agree. So let's say we, we close this session and people can re, can send their questions to us individually uh, by email. Yeah. Uh, do, do we have the emails for the whole, whole speakers? I think we can share uh, yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, Ria will type it, uh, uh, type the email from each of us yeah. uh, while waiting there. We can like sharing that. Okay. okay. That's happy to respond. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I think uh, we will ask uh, the vice director again to do the closing uh, speech. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the uh, very fruitful discussion today uh, on the topic you we already uh, discussed. Uh, it started uh, raining in my house right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much again. Uh, hope, uh, you know, uh, there are steps that you can take, you know, to implement uh, what's neck after neck. I mean, uh, thank you very much on behalf of director. We really appreciate this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So for all, for all the participants, uh, do not forget to uh, register for the certificate. Yeah. And um, I think we, we want to thank you all for being with us. We had uh, almost 200 participants, uh, some pop in, some pop out. It's always uh, difficult to keep track. And thank you also for your interesting questions and you are really advised to, uh, to send to our email address so that you can get a, a good answer. Email group. Uh, sorry, Maya, maybe... Okay. Uh, Thank uh, you maybe, very much, everybody. Yes, can I have one minute? Yeah. Uh, just a quick, because we are having difficulties finding the email. Can we, each of us just writing in the uh, yeah. chat so uh, everybody can see our email? That's okay. Don't forget the screenshot, okay? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So I think we have everybody except for each search. Where, where do you, I'm sorry, where in do you the want chat. to- Can you put your email in the, in chat? the chat? Okay, in the chat. Where At the bottom. Chat? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. Thank you. 
Okay. And we have Diana also. We miss Diana, I think. She forgot about me. Yeah, the, the most important one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so looking forward to having more interactions with all of you. And I think uh, this will all be posted on YouTube, so it will help also to look at it uh, afterwards. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, you. you. Be safe. Be healthy. Bye-bye, you. Yeah. See you. Thank you. Thank you, Padre Pito. Thank you. Thank you. Is that Maya? Thank you, everybody, Bye. for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Dupito. Terima kasih, Bu. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak, Pak. Mudah-mudahan bermanfaat. Sangat, Pak. Sangat bermanfaat. Ya. Ya, terima kasih, Bu. Terima kasih.